Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to be here, and I'm going to talk today about how to deliver fast and beautiful images and video. So let's just get straight into it. A little bit about me. I'm currently doing freelance developer relations, so I help companies figure out how to talk to developers. I also do performance audits on native apps, web apps, trying to figure out, help people make their content run faster. And I talk a lot about images, video, and performance. I wrote a book, High Performance Android Apps, and if you want to download it, that's the PDF, so go for it. I'll post the slides later. If you ever need to get in touch with me, I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm very easy to find. Before we start talking about how to deliver fast images, how many of you get sort of a feeling in the pit of your stomach thinking about walking across this walkway that's nailed into the side of a mountain in Switzerland? Anyone? Right? Pretty terrifying. We walked across this. My six-year-old jumped the whole way, mostly to freak out her older brother and sister. Um, but about a year ago, Ericsson did a study. And in this study, they were looking at what causes stress to people. And they put sensors on people's heads to measure stress responses to different things. They found like queuing for line raises people's stress. They found that walking on the edge of a cliff raises people's stress levels. But interestingly, they found that mobile delays are more stressful than standing on the edge of a cliff. So that feeling you guys all felt 90 seconds ago are what your customers feel when you build something that's slow. And so we want to avoid that, because when people are uncomfortable, they stop using your service. Google found that a three-second delay causes 53% of users to abandon mobile sites. Another study found that a half-second delay increases frustration, lowers engagement. Amazon and Walmart find that people spend less money. So if you're building e-commerce, you know, that's probably important. But 4% of mobile users admit to throwing their phones when there's a slow mobile experience. So this is really, really important. When we look at the average web page, this is from the HTTP archive. They look at half a million websites every two weeks. The average web page is 50% images and 25% video. It's not really 25% video on all uh, web pages. This is sort of the, if Jeff Bezos came in and sat over here in the corner, our average salary would be $50 million a year for all of us, <laughs> right? Because he throws off the average. Um, but video is really big and images are really large. So what can we do to increase the delivery, the, improve the delivery of that content? Does anyone know about Lighthouse tests? All right, so Lighthouse is a Google tool. It's built into Chrome. It's in web page test. We're going to talk about web page tests in a second. And they have four simple image optimizations, quality, format, sizing, and lazy loading. We're going to go through those. Lighthouse gives each web page that it audits a score between 0 and 100. A 0 is bad, 100 is good. So Lighthouse tests are built into web page test. Anyone use web page test here? All right, a few hands. If you're doing web page testing, you should use web page test. It's really awesome. You can test your site anywhere around the world on any type of device. It really helps you understand the performance and how your web page is working. HTTP Archive uses web page test, which uses Lighthouse. So I get all of this data for 500,000 websites. So we can look to see what the internet is doing today for these optimizations. So let's talk about quality first. Lighthouse recommends that you save all your images at 85% quality. So when you change the quality, you're removing pixels, but in general, in 85% quality, no one can notice the difference. And so there are a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can use image magic. There's a laser here, right? You can just set your image and set it to 85, and it generates it for you on the fly. You can use a tool like a cloud tool like Cloudinary. You upload the full size image, you put that parameter in there, it generates a quality 85 image for you on the fly. So what does that look like? This is the original image. I took it on my phone, 3.6 megabytes, 85%. It's half the size, but you can't tell the difference, right? Huge, huge win for everybody. Really easy to implement. But how is it used in the wild? What we find is 43% of the web is doing this right, but a full third of the web is failing completely. They're not doing this at 85%. And then there's some people in the middle. The median site that's failing on 3G would load 2.8 seconds faster if they implemented this. It would save 420 kilobytes of data. So there's a huge performance impact, potential improvement, just by implementing this fix. But what if we could do better? What if we can go better than 85%? Here's that same image at 50%. We save you know, another 900 kilobytes. 
We could go down to 20%, but now the image looks bad, right? We can see that image looks like, just looks horrible. So we wouldn't want to put that on our web page. So we know that we're okay here at 85%. We know that 20% looks bad, but where's the sweet spot in the middle? There's tools that will help us find it. There's Booter Ugly from Google, and there's Structural Similarity, or SSIM. And there's some tools here, right? You can just say, build me that image, or you can say Q Auto with the cloud-based tool, generates that image for you on the fly, and 85%, you may remember, was 1.8 megabytes. We saved another 400 kilobytes by using structural similarity, and the human eye can't tell a difference. So we're speeding up the delivery of that content. We can run that on web page test using a 3G connection on a Moto G4. So this is a real, this is actually a real device that's not emulated. Um, in Virginia, the guy who runs web page tests has just racks of phones in his basement. And what you can see is the load time goes from 21 seconds down to nine and a half seconds, right? 3.7 megabytes to 1.5 uh, megabytes. So we've really improved the speed and the delivery of this image. Let's look at image format. These are the average sizes of the different formats. You can see JPEGs are generally the largest. They're also the most used. Um, let's talk about SVGs, scalable, scalable vector graphics. These are great. They're made from XML, so you can add them inline to your HTML. They're infinitely scalable, right? So that's the same SVG, and it looks the same no matter how big you make it, because it's made of vectors, right? It's just shapes. This is from a website that I found. It's live in Brazil, and they made an SVG, and you can open it up. It's XML. You can look at it, but there's this Adobe Illustrator stuff at the bottom. And so you can do SVGs wrong, and unfortunately this web page did them wrong. It added 1.3 megabytes of Adobe Illustrator cruft into the XML file. So the moral of the story here is it's really easy to fix. You just go into the XML and you strip it all out, and then it's 900 bytes, and then you zip it or broadly, and you get it down to under half a kilobyte. Um, so it's really easy to do, but the moral of the story is, of course, to test after you implement something like this to make sure you did it correctly. They had five SVG files that were over a megabyte on their web page. Um, the other thing we can look at is more modern image formats. So JPEGs are obviously really large, but WebPs are about half the size. And so WebP is a format that was introduced by Google. JPEG is 26 years old, like last month. Um, WebP is about four or five years old, so it's a much newer algorithm. It has better compression built into it. Um, of course, you may say, well, it's a Google format, and you're right. It's supported in Chrome and in Android. Um, however, if you look at the notes, you know, they're working on it in Firefox and Safari, and it's in development in Microsoft Edge until the second when this tweet says that, you know, guess what? It's now in Edge. So I was like, this is awesome. Look, I'm updating my slides almost in real time until I saw this slide at lunch and it's landing in Firefox. So like, this is changing so fast. This is, a, this, I mean, this tweet's from this morning. So that's really, really exciting. So what happens when I take that image and I make it a WebP? It's now down to under a megabyte. So we've made this image smaller and smaller and smaller. It now loads in seven seconds as opposed to nine and a half, right? It's now a megabyte in size. Um, when you look at the HTTP archive and Lighthouse, a full two-thirds of the internet are not doing this. So there's huge potential. And of course, when there's support for every single major modern browser, there's a much makes a lot more sense to implement this. The savings is uh, 4.1 seconds for the site. The median savings is 4.1 seconds on 3G and 600 kilobytes less data on your web page. So really huge potential savings and speed ups for your site. Um, image sizing. So here's an image of a church. I took it with my phone. Again, I do everything. I get it from 1.6 megabytes down to 800 kilobytes. Um, but the problem is it's still 13 megapixels. And when you download that to a phone, the phone downloads 13 megapixels and throws away 12.4 million pixels to put it up on the screen. So if you're on a low powered phone, the CPU has to fire up, throw away all that stuff to put it on the screen. It's sort of like, and I know Amazon isn't a big thing here, but in America, when you buy something from Amazon, like my kid will order two pencils and we'll get a giant box and we have to unroll 10 meters of brown paper to find a box of pencils in the bottom of this box. You're sending so much extra stuff, it's wasteful. And we don't need to do that to our mobile users. So 
The problem is how do you appropriately size images for mobile devices? These are the Android devices that hit Akamai in one day last December. The size of the box is how many of each one, so these are all like Samsung devices. The color is how fast the processor is. So there's thousands and thousands of devices, all different screen ratios, and what we do is we use responsive images. And the example I'm gonna give here of responses, responsive images is to generate a set of images that are all 25 kilobytes different in size. So now, instead of a giant image, I've got an image that fits this size and I'm only wasting 100,000 pixels. It's gonna load a lot faster. I'm not downloading nearly as much data. There are a bunch of tools that'll do this for you. This is an online tool. You set your parameters, it generates a bunch of images, you download them, you put them on your website. You can do this as part of your you know, upload strategy. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And you can build code that looks like this. It serves the right size image for the different viewport. But rather than look at the code, let's do a live demo because that's more fun. So this is the web page. And each one of these images is 25 kilobytes apart. But so that you can tell when a different image is loaded, every other one is sepia. Right? So on the smallest phone, you get a 20, 28 kilobyte image. And on the largest device that you might have, this is 1400 pixels wide, you get 160, right? So you get an appropriately sized image for the device and it's really, really fast. So that's my, uh, let's see here. So what happens now? there's a huge savings because now we've dropped the size of that image by a lot. From one megabyte to 120 kilobytes, it's now five seconds faster on loading. Kind of makes sense. This is fairly well implemented. You know, 60% are passing with 100%, but a full 22% are failing. Those sites that fail would be 2.7 seconds faster on 3G, another 416 kilobytes of savings. So those that aren't doing huge performance possibilities the last thing I'd like to talk about at image optimization is lazy loading. And so the idea behind lazy loading is you've got a, a website that looks like this. You have to load all of these images for the page to completely load. What if you forget about, don't load the ones below the fold to start with, and you use JavaScript to have those pop in later on? What happens now is we only have two images as opposed to six that need to load. Not very well implemented. Again, 60% are not doing this at all, but if they did do it, it would be three and a half seconds faster, 530 kilobytes less data. But we st we've started seeing things, apps that do this. So this is uh, image search, and if you search for cats in costume, these placeholder images pop into place before the pictures of the cats in their costume. And the colors are referenced, like green for the alligator, orange for the pumpkin, you know, it all sort of makes sense. And you can do this, you can do really fancy things. You can put SVGs in place, so you sort of get an idea that they're waterfalls. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can optimize images to speed up the delivery of both your web pages and of the images themselves. But let's now talk a little bit about video before I run out of time here. Same thing happens when video is slow. People get angry, they get frustrated, and we know when people get angry and frustrated, they're gonna throw their phones. So we wanna try to avoid that at all possible. When we talk about video quality metrics, there's three principal metrics. Did the video start? Did the video stall? And did it look good? These are the main metrics when we talk about mobile video. So what can we do to ensure that video looks great? This is data from earlier this year, and earlier this year, this is Conviva, so they do analytics on video delivery. And they found that 2% um, of videos fail to start when people press play. So why do they fail to start? We'll talk about that in a second. They also found that 11%, the customer abandons the video before it starts playing. And so these are things that we can optimize to make uh, the experience a lot better. So all in all, they're saying 2.4 billion video plays failed in Q1 of this year, which is about 800 million hours of video playback that were lost. Let's try to figure out what's going on. Let's look at these 400 million that failed to start. Looking through some of the data, I see a bunch of 404s and 500 errors, but it's less than 1%, so there's some issues with that. I think a lot of it is stuff like this. I'm sure we've all seen this, right? You just can't watch it in your country. When I use Amazon from the States, and I try to log in here to watch Amazon video, it says, hey, you're abroad. We can't show you these movies, but here are the ones you can watch. I'm told in advance, to not even try to watch this movie because they don't have the rights to show it in the country I'm in. 
But in this case, in Chrome DevTools, it took 231 requests and 3.1 megabytes to tell me that that video wasn't available. And that's kind of wasteful. I'd just like to know in advance rather than to have all this stuff happen. Um, they did have a, a, a beacon monitoring that I couldn't watch it. I was just really slow on my screenshot, so that's why it looks like it took 18 seconds there. But what about the videos that fail to start? Why do videos fail to start? Or why do people, sorry, why do people abandon videos? And what it turns out is people will hang out for two seconds. If you press play on a video, 100% of people will wait for two seconds for that video to start. But every additional second afterwards, you lose 6% of your users. And it depends on the type of video, how quickly people abandon. For short play videos, people give up faster. So if you click on a video of a cat in a shark costume on a Roomba chasing a duck, after about three seconds, you start questioning your life choices. <laughs> and you're like, what? and you move on, because it didn't start playing. But if you're gonna watch a TV show, or you're gonna watch a movie, you're already, you know, you're already invested 20 minutes, an hour, two hours, you're gonna hang out a little bit longer, and you can see that, you know, the red line, people hang out, they don't abandon quite as quickly. So what can we do to speed up the delivery of video? One option might be to use, in the video tag, there's a preload option, you could say preload equals auto. And that's really great. So this is the web page loading. This is the, uh, the waterfall. You can see all the different requests coming in. Browsers are smart and video is large. So the last thing that it downloads is always the video. So in this case, you can see here's the video being downloaded. Just like that, whether or not you wanted to watch it or not. And it turns out, this is just a web page that I went to and it downloads 23 megabytes of video, whether or not I want to watch that video or not on my mobile phone. Right? So if you're going to a, a site on your mobile phone, you're like, well, I don't really want to watch the video because I don't want to waste all that data on my mobile plan. In this case, the website decided for you. And the other problem, of course, is if you're the company that builds this, you're paying for all of that you know, data coming out of your server, 23 megabytes anytime someone hits the home page of your website, which could add up if you have a lot of people hitting your web page. So the other options you can use is you can use uh, preload equals metadata. That downloads the first couple percentage, you know, the first 3% of your video file. That's a great option, except for make sure your videos aren't really huge, because I've seen preload, you know, if you have a 100 megabyte video and you download the first 3%, that's still three megabytes of video, whether or not someone watches the video or not. So preload equals auto is fabulous if you know that people are gonna watch the video, high percentage, but otherwise you probably shouldn't be using that. Background videos. So background videos are really awesome. This is a web page that has a background video. Get rid of the GDPR thing at the bottom, um, right? Research has shown that when you have a background video, you get about 80% more engagement to your website. So that's really huge. This is something that a lot of people want to add to their web pages. Now what's interesting about this background video is that background video is 5.3 megabytes. That in and of itself isn't that bad. But 5% of the file is audio and you never hear the audio. So it's like, if the video plays and there is no audio, did it make a sound? Um, in this case, we're wasting a whole bunch of data. If it's a silent video, if you're playing it in the background and it's never ever gonna play, just remove the audio stream. It'll download faster. It will appear on the screen faster and your customers will get that great experience and they won't know the difference. The only reason I found this is I was looking through the data and the name of that background video is called steven.mp4. Like, why the heck is that? And I was, and so I had to look at the video and then I realized what it was doing. It was all messed up. So if you don't want people to find it, name it something like background video, and then I won't look for it uh, when I'm looking through all the data that I have collected. The other thing, if you have a background video on mobile, this is the mobile waterfall. There's the background video downloading. But if your screen is less than 600 pixels wide, it downloads it and it doesn't appear on the screen. So you're wasting all of that data downloading the video and never showing it to your customers. So if your viewport isn't gonna support the video, don't download it. Save all of that data, save it coming out of your back end, you're right, it's gonna run a lot faster. Here's another background video for another website that I found. We're gonna see some other issues that this webpage, that this video has. Um, you'll never ever see the background video if you visit this webpage because it loads so slowly 
even if you type in the URL and put it in the browser, it still stalls just to play the video because it's so large. The first thing you learn about this background video is Bob Ross is not just a painter. <laughs> However, this vi background video is 33 megabytes, it's 27 seconds long, and it's 2,500 by 1,200 pixels wide, which is really, really large. 10 megabits per second. So best practice, resize this for a reasonable size for desktop, for mobile. Um, pro tip, renaming the file to 720p does not actually make the video 720p. It's new. If I resize that, I used Cloudinary, I just resized the width, right? I get this, you know, we get some fairly reasonable sizes. Maybe you serve that one to the desktop, you serve one of these, you know, one of the smaller ones to mobile. This is gonna load, people will actually see it. That's probably pretty useful. The last example I wanna give you is third parties. So TED Talks, everyone loves TED Talks, everyone loves watching TED Talks, right? All right, I see some nods, right? So this is great. I wanna share this TED Talk, it's awesome. So you click the share button, it gives you this embed link, awesome. So I built a web page, body, you know, HTML body, paste and body and HTML, right? Um, there it is, 118 requests, 32 megabytes transferred for adding one line of code to my web page. So when you get embed links, test, see what they're doing. It may actually not just be one link that's being added, it added 117 requests and 32 megabytes to the download of this page when I loaded it on my desktop. It's not as big on mobile because it's streaming, so it's a lower amount of data, but it's a similar number of requests. So in conclusion, optimize your images for quality, format, sizing, lazy load if possible. For video, only download video when it's displayed. Strip out the audio if it's a silent video. Resize your images, resize the videos for mobile, and audit anything third party that you add to your website. These are a bunch of the tools that I used. I'll post all the slides so you can get those later. But in conclusion, images and video can be fast and beautiful. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. Remember to rate the talk on Joined In. We have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any, maybe one or two. I see a hand. Great talk, thank, thank you. you. Um, having said that, have you got the time, no, did you have the time to try out Cloudflare's uh, integration for video that was announced lately? Today? I, was thinking of, you know, I haven't had a chance to check it from today. No, I haven't. All right. All right. I found the tweet from today. I was really proud of that. Well done. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Any of that? Yeah, so nice talk. But uh, how many of these practices will be integrated into the platform? Because so the way I see that a lot of these things are like things that you have to do as a developer, but is it possible to push some things to browsers or the standards? So. If you're downloading the image and the browser is reprocessing it, you're, you've already missed the transit time from it being downloaded, right? So um, if, you, if your browser, if the web page can, there, so there are things like client hints, uh, which has been disabled in Chrome, but the idea there is the client, the browser will say, hey, the screen is X pixels wide, and then the server can just send the right size image down. That's coming, but it's been disabled because there's some privacy concerns with broadcasting information about people's dimensions of their browser. So there still will be an element of the server backend serving the right image down. So client hints is one way the browser might facilitate that as opposed to having putting it in your HTML. Time for one more question. Uh, hi, thank hey. you for your speech. Uh, I wonder how well this plays with SEO optimization. What's your experience with that? Uh, techniques like lazy loading of images, especially. So for SEO, one of the things in Google is how fast the page loads on mobile. So if you can speed up the delivery, if you can make your page load faster, that raises your SEO according to Google. So they do rank page time loading. Um, so all of the content is there. So your alt tags will still be there. It's just that the images haven't loaded until they scroll down to see them. Does that help? 
I, I wonder if they see them at, at all, what, what's going on, because they, they are lazy loaded from JavaScript, I suppose, so. Right, so when you scroll down, it, I mean, a lot of ways you use like the intersection observer, so it knows where your viewport is, and so when you get close, it downloads the images so that they appear when it's time. Okay, so the, the browser knows that the images are there, they just haven't loaded them until the, 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 you scroll down to near where they're gonna be on the page. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you bet.